Okay, class, in this next unit, we're going to discuss some other mechanisms of blood pressure control. Um, so again, we talked about the barrier reflex and barrier receptors. Next, we'll get into some other mechanisms. Again, there's a ton. We're just going to focus on a few. Uh, so the next reflex we'll talk about is the myogenic reflex. So the myogenic reflex is an intrinsic property of the smooth muscle in blood vessels, particularly in the resistance vessels. Uh, it's not something that we're really going to see in the conduit vessels, like the femoral or the you know, brachial, for example. Um, but we're going to see in those smaller um, resistance vessels, right, in arterioles. Um, basically, what these do is they help keep blood flow constant um, within those vascular, small vascular beds and, and in the capillaries. And also, probably more importantly, keep capillary hydrostatic pressure constant. Um, so, for example... If the pressure within a vessel suddenly increases, so say you know, we'll draw our little you know, schematic here. So we've got a resistance vessel, right, more proximally in the arterial tree. Um, then we've got our capillary, right, resistance in our capillary bed, right. So say the pressure in here increases, right. We have a high, high upstream pressure, okay, to prevent. We'll draw a capillary here to prevent, you know, too much pressure, too much flow potentially moving into the capillaries. We would cause, we would constrict at the rest or the resistance vessel. Uh, this essentially basically siphons off the hose from pushing higher pressures down in the capillary. It helps protect the capillaries. Remembering the capillaries a little bit thinner don't tolerate super high pressures. So if we notice upstream, hey, we've got too much pressure um, potentially moving downstream, let's constrict and reduce the pressure downstream. Conversely, if we notice, hey, the pressure in the resistance vessels are is too low, right? There's not enough pressure, right? Not enough volume moving through. We'll cause dilation, right? To allow, you know, you know, to keep capillary blood, capillary hydrostatic pressure constant. So again, say in our resistance vessel, we have, you know, we have got reduced capillary or reduced uh, pressure. We will cause dilation of the vessel, right? To normalize capillary um, hydrostatic pressure, okay? Um, again, you know, we, we find that this is an intrinsic property of the vascular smooth muscles. Um, we think they depolarize when they're stretched, lead to contraction. Um, so again, it's, uh, we, you know, it's an intrinsic property. I actually think it's independent of, of having a, a functional uh, endothelium. This is a, an intrinsic property of the smooth muscle. Why this is important, um, here, and here's an example right, that you might see often as a PT. So when a person goes from a vertical position a horizontal position to a vertical position, like going from supine to standing, there's going to be a large increase in hydrostatic pressure in the vessels in the lower extremities. That makes sense. Basically, we had pressures that were relatively level, right, in terms of you know, fluid pressures. Now we've shifted that to upright, causing a hydrostatic, basically, column of fluid. Therefore, if things on the bottom are going to have higher hydrostatic pressure. What this causes um, is a stretch of those vessels in the lower legs, which triggers a myogenic reflex and causes the pre-capillary blood vessels, those resistance vessels, to constrict in response to that imposed stretch. What this causes is a temporary cessation of blood flow um, into most of the lower extremity capillaries. It's temporary. It will eventually balance out once plasma oncotic, um, and interstitial fluid pressure balances out again, you know, after that perturbation in, in, in uh, standing. Um, why this is important, if this reflex, right, this property didn't exist, that increase in hydrostatic pressure would reach such a high level that we'd have fluid filtrating from the capillaries into the interstitial fluid compartments, causing edema every single time we stand. Um, so it's really, really important, right? We don't want to get edema every single time we stand. We want to keep those capillaries uh, protected. And we want to prevent edema 
right? So, you know, kind of a very practical uh, situation for why uh, this is relevant. Um, next, we're going to get into autoregulation of organ blood flow. So autoregulation um, basically describes the ability for an end organ, um, so like the brain, the kidneys, uh, to, to, to maintain stable capillary pressures. Now, you may be asking, well, that sounds a lot like, you know, myogenic responses. That sounds a lot like um, metabolic autoregulation, like we talked about uh, functional sympatholysis. And you might be right. Um, we actually think there may be a combination um, of different mechanisms that describe this phenomena that we occur. But either way, um, you know, it's an important thing to understand because it explains the symptoms that we see in hypertension emergencies. But it also explains like how how um, our organs basically keep blood flow uh, pretty consistent to them. Typically, organs that have a high metabolic activity have a much higher autoregulatory capacity. And that makes sense because organs like our brain, like our kidneys, um, we like to try to keep the, bl the, the blood flow to them, you know, pretty constant. Um, so uh, in this figure here, um, we, sh we show situations where we'd have decreased perfusion pressure, right? So, um, in the, you know, right here we've gotten a situation where we've reduced perfusion pressure from 100 millimeters of mercury to 70. Pretty significant drop. In a passive vascular bed, uh, one that does not show autoregulation, this will result in a rapid and sustained fall in blood flow. So here's our, you know, where we drop things off from 100 to 70. Again, pressure is real low. And then, oh, we see a massive reduction, right, in blood flow. In a vascular bed, it's capable of undergoing autoregulatory behavior. Um, after the initial fall in perfusion pressure and flow, the flow will gradually increase, which we see this red line over the next few minutes as the vasculature begins to dilate, right, resistance drops. Um, and after a few minutes, the flow will achieve a new steady state. Um, and again, if the vascular bed has a high degree of autoregulation, we see this in the brain, the coronaries, the kidneys, um, that new steady state may be very close to normal despite reduced perfusion pressure. Um, and this is super relevant for the brain, which we have an example here. Um, and it shows a kind of tight window that we're able to keep things um, consistent. Why this is important, there's, there's a point by which this begins to fail. Um, so in situations where we see a mean arterial pressure uh, below 60, like we see in patients with cardiogenic shock, we see we lose the ability to keep pressure within this tight range. So you know, we'll kind of look at our graph here. So we've got um, you know our, our x-axis. We've got mean arterial pressure here increasing from left to right, and then cerebral blood flow right increasing here from you know, top to bottom. As we can see here from this graph, um, you know we keep we're able to keep blood pressure uh, or blood flow in the brain pretty consistent over a range of about 60 to 140 millimeters of mercury mean pressure. If pressure gets too high, we're able to constrict, keep blood flow consistent, right, without going up so high. If it drops off, we're able to dilate to keep blood flow relatively consistent, like we saw in that last example here, right, where we drop, have a sudden precipitous drop in blood pressure. There's a limit though, right? If we get to points where blood pressure mean, right, mean arterial pressure, MAP, right, you know, is greater than, say, 140, um, 140 migs, we lose the ability to keep blood flow from increasing past that kind of normal set range. Conversely, if blood pressure drops too low, like below 60 mean, right, we start seeing, you know, a precipitous drop in blood flow. Uh, that's why, again, we see, you know, in patients maybe with a, a critical hyper, critical blood pressure, we start seeing like stroke-like symptoms, in them because their, ba their brain basically flooded with pressure and high pulse style flow, which is dam damaging the capillaries within the brain. Um, that's why we see patients go into cardiogenic shock, typically at pressures below 60 mean. So again, this is how autoregulation 
um, manifest in terms of organ systems and why like it's, you know, understanding this underlying physiology for why blood pressure values can, can lead to certain conditions. Um, you know, it, it helps you kind of understand what you're seeing in front of you. So uh, we'll, we'll end here. And then the last thing we'll wrap up uh, was the role of the kidneys and the, uh, the RAS system.